Let's talk about how we can actually structure our shots with Unreal, because this is the part that usually got people mixed up. Unreal gives a ton of flexibility, which is really, really awesome, but we also want to have a clear plan before we actually start dropping cameras everywhere into the scenes. In these sections, we are going to talk about how to create the backbone of your cinematics using level sequences. Also, how to set them up properly, what is the correct frame rate to achieve the cinematic look, and how to organize your work properly using subsequences. Finally, I'm going to show you what are the key differences between the word partition and the level streaming workflow collaboration between teams. Next, we are going to talk about level sequences, which are basically Unreal Engine built-in timeline management system. And this is where all your cinematic matching will happen. If you ever used After Effects Premiere Pro or Blender's timeline, then you will feel right at home. Level sequences are actually containers that can hold camera cuts, keyframes, animations, and even events. And it tells Unreal what and when it should happen and how long it should last. If it is existing in a level, you can keyframe it, regardless if it is a camera, a light, or an actor. If you want to make a light to change color or flicker, or you want to animate the camera to smoothly slide into the scene, all goes into the level sequence. And there are two options to create them. One of them is the manual way, I will show you. And there is another way that is provided by Unreal. But let's just go with the manual way. To do that one, right-click anywhere into the content browser, go to the cinematics, and search for level sequences. By clicking it, you can name it whatever you want, but I would strongly recommend to follow the visual effects um, naming convention, which is first the sequence name after the shot name. So I tend to use abbreviations, just go seek, and then 01, and then underscore sh0010. And it's going to define which sequence and which shot are we in. If you double click on it, you can see how does it look like. But if you want to create multiple shots, it's not really the best way because it can be tedious to create hundreds of shots at the same time. However, thankfully, I already provided a new tool called, which can be accessed by here and select the add level sequence by shots. This little batch tool will let you create multiple shots at the same time with the predefined settings. You can um, set how long do they last, how many shots do we want to have, where they should be. And also it's an amazing option that you can create subsequences for that one. And I strongly recommend it because if multiple people are working at the same time on different shots, then um, it's going to be much more easier to collaborate if they are having their own custom level sequences. So I would advise to create one for the camera one for the environment, one for the visual effects, one for the characters, and maybe one more for the props. And when we have these ones, and just click on the create level sequences with shots, Unreal will create a master sequence where we can review our shots. And if we double click on it, we can see that it automatically created the camera cut along with the desired subsequences that we define. It is a really amazing tool, and I recommend everyone to use this one if they have the chance. One, if not the most essential part on achieving the cinematic look in our project, is on deciding on the proper frame rate. Unreal Engine is usually used by game developers, and there, the higher the frame rate, the better it is. However, when you are looking at the footage is shot with 60 FPS or even more, they tend to look gameish they don't look cinematic at the slightest. So what is the solution? What is the secret to achieve that look what you would see if you go into the theaters and look at the big screens? So just follow the same thing what the big movie collections are doing. Shoot renders with 24 frames per second. It's going to create a much more choppy shots, but because of the motion blur, we are going to have a much more realism. Just to give you an example, I have this following shot where the character is moving towards the camera. On the right side I have the 60 FPS version, on the left side I have the 24 FPS version. We could see on the right side there is not so much motion blur happening, you could see all the details and it feels like a game. However, on the other side, uh, the motion blur is really strong and everything is blurred away because of the lower frame rate. And it tends to give you a much more realism 
what you would see in a movie theater in the big screen. Just a little thing to know that in Unreal, whenever we create level sequences, either manually or automatically with the wedge tool, the default frame rate is set to 30 FPS. Unfortunately, there is no default settings where we can change it globally, so you have to do it manually. There is a little setting up here, which is set to 30, and there are a drop-down option where you can choose different ones. If you choose 24 FPS, it's going to choose not only for the currently opened one, but also all the subsequences that are nested below. So you can see when I open it up, we have 24 FPS. But notice when I change the subsequence to a different one, let's say back to 30 FPS, the system is going to give you a warning that the sequence that we are in present have a different frame rate than the other one. So at least it gives you some kind of verification that something is going wrong. If I change it back to 24 FPS, now we are all set. Well, you might ask, why subsequences? Just imagine that you are in a big studio where multiple artists have to work on the same shot at the same time. They tend to use some kind of version control system, such as Fairforce, which lets them to collaborate and contribute to the project effectively. However, when we are working with assets, Fairforce usually locks them down from the other artists, so there is no mismatch between the different versions. But it's kind of problematic because if they have to work on the same asset, they have to wait until their turn comes. If you're looking at this example, we can see that in this level sequence, we have a camera, we have a character that has to be animated and multiple lights. Because all of them reside in the same level sequence, the artist who should work with their own delegated task, they have to wait until their turn comes. So what is the solution for this one? We can just go back to the other sequences, what we created, and here we can see we have not just one sequence, but we have multiple ones. They are called subsequences. So in the main one, we have the camera cut and the camera. So the guy who have to take care of the camera animation, they can work on here. And the guy who have to work on the character animation, we have the character subsequence. They can just do their magic. And same goes to the lights. It's really easy. And if we go back to the content browser, we can see that instead of just one asset, we have six assets now. So we just multiplied the amount of person who can work on the shot by six. So it's really, really amazing. And what's even more better that you can just scale it up to your own needs. So if you need four more persons to work on the shots, you can just create four more levels subsequences. Now let's talk about the differences between level streaming and birth partition. Level streaming is good for small condensed map where we don't have to handle large distances. Word partition, on the other hand, is good for handling huge distances, huge vistas. For the level streaming, in this example, we can see that I created a main level that calls all the sub-levels for the each individual category, similar to what we have for level sequences. It's really amazing because when an artist places a new actor into the scene, Pairforce checks them out, similarly what we had in level sequences. But when they have their own individual levels that they can play with, they can just work parallel next to each other. So if you look at here in the level step, we have the main levels and all these sub-levels. If you want to add your own, it is really simple. You can just right click anywhere in the content browser, create a new level, name it whatever you want. So let's test, press enter. And then you can just drag and drop it under the level step. Notice that there's a little green dot next to it, which means that it is not loaded. That's why it is streaming. If you want to have it always loaded, just right click and change streaming method to always loaded. When it is done, it will be immediately there. If you're talking about word partition, it's a totally different thing because it enables something called one file per actor edit. And it basically lets you uh, multiple users or artists to work on the same level without actually worrying about locking each other out from during the whole process. I have an example where we have a work partition level. And even though I don't have to worry about anyone else, I would still recommend to create something called data layers. Data layers is a way to organize your content in the work partition settings. To create a data layer, right click in the content browser, go down into the word, and select data layer. Name it something appropriate, and it is as easy to use it as drag and drop it into the data layers outliner. 
If you don't see it, you can just go into the window where partition and data layer, data layers outliner. To actually add actors to the data layer, go into the actor, write data layer, and then scroll down to the data layers assets. Click on the plus sign and select the one that you wanted. Now we can see if it is added and I can just enable and disable. It is as easy and I would definitely recommend to use it. Another amazing thing what I would really recommend to everyone to try out in Unreal are the takes. It's a built-in feature where we are able to create new versions for the same shot by right-clicking on the camera cut and create a new take. Unreal will detect it and increment it with a new version. And if we click on save, it will be automatically assigned on the, the take to the latest one. So if we double click on it, we can see that it is the existing thing what we had before, we can, but we can make any kind of alteration if we want to. So for example, here we have the light color. So if I scroll down and change it to, I don't know, pinkish, and it is already there. And we can see it in our main sequence. However, it doesn't stop there. You can alter it even more. For example, here we have a totally different camera angle and movement. So that's why it is really amazing to, to experiment with takes because it's a non-destructive way to try out new things. So to wrap it up, in this section we learned about what are level sequences and how can we use them to animate our own cinematics within Unreal. Also, what is the proper shot structure and how can we create them either manually or automatically with the batch tool provided, and what is the correct frame rate to use to achieve that very specific cinematic look. Also, we learned about subsequences and takes, how can we utilize them to improve our overall workflow, and lastly, I show you what are the key differences when we are working with level streaming and work partition, and how to use sublevels and data layers. In the following section, I'm going to introduce you to the key camera properties and how to use them.